I'm big and I'm country. So halftime, I'm looking at the stats. Shaq, 15, big country, 26. <laughs> and he was successful because he was big, but nobody ever saw him as a great basketball player. You know, he just got saddled with a bad rap. Yeah, because he was a stiff. He's, he's, he's... I think it's the reason there. Is he just, like, not work out enough in the summer? He Bryant Reeves is one odd case. For every person that remembers him in infamy, there's a kid who has no idea who this guy is. And for every person who thinks he was the shining star of the short-lived Vancouver Grizzlies, there's a guy who thinks he's the worst player in NBA history? Okay, what the f- As one of the most unique guys to ever grace the floor, to get the full idea of his story, we need to start back where big country became big country. Born in Gans, Oklahoma, a town of 218 residents, 34 cats, and 42 dogs, he was living the southern boy life, growing up bagging bucks and ripping lips in a town where everyone knew everyone on the inside. Bryant was known as the big friendly giant with pictures up in every bait shop in town with an armful of striped bass. But outside of the city, he was known as the 7 foot 16 year old with soft hands he was holding the world in. Reeves was a pretty widely known prospect throughout the entire state due to his ridiculous size allowing him to put up 30 point double doubles throughout his tenure and introduce hundreds of scouts and coaches to the exciting world of Gans, Oklahoma. At a time where size ruled all, he was the guy around the state and a future in basketball was pretty much inevitable with coaches like Bobby Knight and Eddie Sutton taking the trip down the dirt roads to catch a glimpse of the big country show. He was a hot commodity as a prospect, but loaded with question marks refusing to leave his hometown for a bigger school. Since, well, this was home. Turned down an opportunity to play for a better team to increase his scouting pool and better develop himself for the next level to play for his home crowd of 30 people was a pretty humble decision, but it came with its own set of consequences. After totaling the state lead in 32 a game as a senior against a bunch of kids who stood at his armpit, he was looked at as a project in the eyes of coach Eddie Sutton after committing to Oklahoma State University. And as a clumsy 7 foot kid who seemed not caught up to how fast he was growing, he was certainly right. Being thrown into the starting lineup his freshman year was a growing pain going from small town high school ball to a high major university. He was a tall kid with a great attitude and some soft hands but had never played against half decent competition. The bigger issue however came from his atrocious conditioning. Legendary coach Hank Iba reportedly said the 270 pounder was flabby, uncoordinated, and needed a bra. 8 and 5, he was definitely decent as a freshman but a project player nonetheless. What surprised many was how quickly he turned this thing around. Because by his sophomore year, Big Country quickly jumped up to one of the best posts in the country. At a near 20 and 10 double double, taking home Big 8 Player of the Year, he was definitely expanding his game and blowing up his name in the process. A chunkier kid who played the hard nosed post dominated game of the 90s, who actually moved pretty quick for kind of being a fatty. He was fun, he was entertaining, and most of all, he was damn effective. Over the next two years, he became known as one of the most solid traditional bigs in the college game, with big moments like a half-court buzzer beater against Missouri and infamous battles against Greg Ostertag. But the major mainstream attention started rolling in in his senior year. For the third season in a row, putting up an efficient 20-10-ish season, Big Country put on a show for his last year at Oklahoma against some of the best bigs in the country in the NCAA tournament. 20-piece on Antonio McDice, 25 on Marcus Camby, even Tim Duncan caught some buckets as they rolled into the Final Four. His big time tournament play and consistently dominating play over the last three years made him one of the most hyped draft prospects in the country. At 290 pounds, he was as strong as an ox, and pretty dominant at this level due to his soft hands and post entry passes, the strength to get easy shots one on one, and great touch to capitalize off easy looks as well. He was a very solid post player. But outside of that, he was still a really solid big man across the board, with an above average mid-range game, diverse moves down low, and a relatively high IQ offensively, establishing positioning, and the ability to predict cuts and flares better than most bigs out there. Defensively, he also tended to find himself in the right spot at the right time. Although not a great shot blocker due to his average at best athleticism, he was definitely projected to be serviceable in the NBA and above average in college at this time. With high lottery hype, 
Big Country found himself as the new face of Vancouver basketball, going sixth overall to the Grizzlies. Actually, he was the first face of Vancouver basketball for their inaugural season in the 95-96 run. After the Canadian expansion, Big Country was a selling point for a brand new team up north. The talent was laughably poor on this team. And a lot of guys were old for their lack of production in his rookie year, but that didn't stop Reeves from putting up a pretty decent season. 13-7 and in an all-rookie second team is not bad by any means, and his pretty poor efficiency in this season can be somewhat explained by a lack of secondary options. Although the worst team in the league at 15-67, and yeah, terrible, I know, Vancouver did have some reasons to be optimistic. Reeves did show potential to be an above-average center of the league and likely a future all-star. This mixed with the drafting of Sharif Abdul-Rahim, who proved to be the best player in the franchise's short-lived history, looked like the Grizzlies may have had a little core starting to grow. The two played pretty well the next season as Big Country improved around the board. 16-8 with the shooting percentage going up with Sharif as their other primary scoring option, despite the talent, the Grizzlies were still abysmal. I mean, when your far and away best players are in their early 20s, you're probably in trouble. They weren't good enough to carry a team and the Grizzlies finished at an even worse 14 and 68. There was pretty little to be happy about, I mean to be blunt, it's two guys and a bunch of NPCs. They had to lock up Reeves after the next season and rewarded him with a 6 year, 61 million dollar extension. That's a lot of money for 20 years ago. In hindsight, and likely even at the time, it's pretty clear that this was an overpayment. Brian was a good player in his first two years of NBA basketball. His skills as an interior scorer were crucial in putting up points when no one else can create, but that's a lot of money for a guy who had a pretty definitive ceiling. Largely due to his pretty lackluster defense, at an all-time bad 109 defensive rating, even though partly due to the very bad defensive system of the Vancouver Grizzlies. The following year you can see a pretty clear plateau. He stayed pretty consistent averaging 16-8 on slightly improved shooting. All in all, I think it's safe to say up to this point that he is as advertised as entering the league. An interior scorer with soft hands who found a lot of success scoring at a time that's uh, literally the best post talent ever. There probably wasn't a ton of room to grow for him at this point, but being a future all-star at some point seemed pretty reasonable, since he really wasn't too too far off with the totals he's been averaging over the last two years. That was until the quick downfall came around. July 1st, 1998 marked the third NBA lockout in NBA history, lasting until mid-January the following year. During this time, Reeves was eating, alright. He came back very overweight. I can't guarantee to you that this was due to the weight, but it definitely didn't help as he would battle nagging injuries that would affect the quantity and quality of his on-court performance. Playing half the season in limited minutes, he played really bad, man. 11 a game on 40% shooting and terrible defense, dropping a .3 blocks and 2 fouls a game. This was sadly his future. A steady decline the following two years with knee problems often slowing him down, and back issues leaving him in crippling pain so bad he was forced to retire after just 6 short years in the NBA. As Big Country's play declined, his reputation as an on-court talent was only as good as his last game. Known as one of the better young players in the league during his short prime in his early 20s, he would later go down by some as a player who busted in the league, costed Vancouver their team with his ludicrous contract, and is one of the worst talents to ever touch the league? Apparently, none of these are true. Big Country may not have been a generational talent, but he was on his way to be one of the better ones of his time. His game may not be effective in the modern NBA, but in the mid-90s, that bruiser style of play gave guys like Shaq issues. His contract, although poor, wasn't the reason that a team that was burning paper like a wildfire had to move. Well, he was the only reason the six fans who would show up every game were in attendance. And if you ever hear someone put Reeves anywhere near the worst to ever do it, never listen to anything they ever have to say seriously again. As his career may have crumbled, it's hard to say his life did. He continues to give back to the community, hosting camps in rural Oklahoma and living an off-the-grid life on a 500-acre cattle farm. You can't take the country out of the boy, I guess. He may have been a little bit funny looking, and his lack of conditioning and love of food may have cost him a career, but big country will always be one of one and served as a model for plenty of kids to follow. Thank you for watching if you made it this far. Love you boys, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.